Hello, everybody. I'm Kenneth Copeland. Let's have a word of prayer. We get right into today's Bible lesson. Father, we do thank you and we praise you. We worship you today, sir. We look to you for revelation from heaven, words that move heaven on the earth. Thank you, sir. All is well in the household of faith. And we give the glory for all that's said and for all that's done to the matchless, magnificent name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our champion. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you believe that, say amen and give the Lord a praise. <laughs> Thursday, oh, this week has gone by. My, my, my. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, we've been talking about David being a covenant man, so aware of his covenant with God that when he came up against this giant that's roughly nine feet, ten and a half inches tall, I mean, the man's coat weighed 125 pounds. This is a, an awesome sight. And at the sight of the man, not, they didn't wait to hear what he said to say. At the sight of him, they, they, they ran. David didn't care how big he was. He had a covenant with God. He fully planned to kill him, and he did. Amen. Now, <laughs> Let's look here in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 55. When Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, who is this kid? Whose son is he? And he said, uh, King, I, I don't know. And the king said, Inquire whose son is he? And David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Abner took him and brought before Saul with the head. With the head of the Philistine in his hand. He still had this head. That was the trophy of that fight. Now, I want to say something to you and ask you a question. Now, think about it before you answer. Who made David king? Goliath. Goliath made him king. Nobody knew who he was until he came in with his head. Are you hearing me? Yes, you see where I'm going with this? Yes. In, um, have you any former Marines in here? You know the Marine hymn, right? You know, you know can you sing it? From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. What's that mean? Well, I'm not a Marine. I don't know. Well, it's time you found out. <laughs> the first engagement outside the United States was a detachment of Marines aboard ship an Islamic king was making demands of the president, third president of the United States, $250,000. 
ransom for your ships. Some things never change. In Tripoli, Libya, and the president sent a detachment of Marines, all eight of them, <laughs> led by a young lieutenant by the name of John O'Banion. Can't you just see that sharp, red-headed Irish Marine? <laughs> but he led, he and seven other Marines led an army of mercenaries. Army. And he had to deal with some of them and get them straightened out, but he did it. And this Yusuf, this Muslim king, rather than face eight Marines, gave up. Yeehaw! <laughs> uh, hey, come on. Rather than face eight Marines. That is the spirit of David against Goliath. I thought you'd enjoy hearing that. And what happened? The country was reborn. Because it was in trouble. It was in bad trouble right then. Well, and then you know what happened in 1865. <sighs> Took a long, skinny, not a very good looking man until he became who he is. But he's beautiful in my sight. The first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln. My God. I dare say, the first martyr of this nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Glory. Somebody ought to shout yeah. amen yeah. in this classroom today. And the country was reborn again. Yeah. I had the Lord say to me several years ago, just as clear. Now I've never heard the audible voice of God. One time I heard what sounded audible to me. That was when the first time I flew over this property, it was at night, I was by myself and uh, I just flown over this property. I didn't know it was this property at the time. And I heard <clears throat> in a radio voice, coming to you from the revival and capital of the world. I looked down at my audio panel to see if I'd turned the, the the, that uh, the low frequency radio on, and I, which I never do. And I, and I thought, boy, I know where the I know where the political capital of the world is. That's Washington D.C. I know where the entertainment capital of the world is. That's Hollywood. I know where the country music capital of the world is. Nashville, Tennessee. Where's the revival capital of the world? Uh, I don't know. And I just got busy and. And uh, it was nighttime and I was, I was coming in just right there to approach and I had to call and get it, you know, it's clear, beautiful, clear night. So I wasn't on instruments or anything and, and, uh, and landed, forgot about it. Well, <clears throat> then a man on our board at that time called me sometime later and he said, Brother Kenneth, there's a piece of property out here in North of Town I think we need to go look at. I said, yeah, sure. We came out here. Well, then I remembered what it was because when I was in high school, they came out here and had drag races and they had their stuff on these runways out here that the Navy built in 1942. So, um, which is the airport now. So, to make a long story short, we, we came out to see this and, and it just, you know, so I just put my foot on the barbed wire fence and held it up. Gloria crawled through it. 
and I just stepped over it. When I stepped over that fence and turned around, I heard it coming to you. No, he said, this is the revival capital of the world and you're going to build it. I just stood there and shook. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. Hallelujah. Early 70s. Anyway, um, it, it pays to listen and obey. Now you come out here, uh, what, 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 what am I going to do with 1,520 acres of land? I mean, I, I couldn't have bought a chicken and setting hen and chicks in the home right then. How am I going to do this? I don't care. That's not my problem. That's God's problem. That's His problem, not mine. But I believed it. I believed it. I told Gloria, she said, well, yeah. Amen. Well, and later, of course, I had to find out who owned it. It was a man by the name of Pewitt. He was in the oil and gas business and never had married. And he was a large donor to um, uh, SMU and, and uh, he, he was just, just a strong man of God, 89 years old. So, I went to see him. And uh, I had a young man with me back in those days, the name of Neil Hale. And I told Neil, and you're going to like this, I learned this from my dad. Now, we talked about Samson, right? And we understand that the Bible said that Samson killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. My dad said to me, Kenneth, my dad was a world class salesman. And he said, Now, Kenneth, and I, I worked for him a while. He said, when we go in there, keep your mouth shut. I like to talk. <laughs> now, this is the reason why when I became Oral Roberts' driver and they said, you don't talk to him unless he talks to you first. Well, I'd already learned how to do that because my dad taught me. And here's what he said. He said, Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass, and ten times that many sales have been killed with the same weapon. A salesman had talked too much. So we went in there, well, knocked on the door. He came, talked very slow. And uh, I introduced myself, and he came in. We came in. A little small house over here at Glen Rose, Texas. And at the time, he was worth uh, roughly $300 million. But it's just he and his niece live there. I said, Mr. Pewitt, uh, now, I heard exactly what the Lord said to say, and you don't say any more or any less. I said, Mr. Pewitt, the property out at Eagle Mountain. The Lord had need of that property. Now we're inside the house. He said, well, it's for sale. I knew that. I didn't say anything. We sat down, seemed like hours. He had a, a, a real tick-tock clock sitting on the mantel. I mean, it was a real one, and you could hear it every time the little pendulum swung. One kind of wind up in the back. We sat there a few moments. I said, Mr. Pewitt, <clears throat> we don't have any money. We must have sat there 20 minutes. He didn't say a word. I didn't either. You boys come back to see me. I said, yes, sir. Thank you. So we made our appointment, came back, went through the same procedure. 
sat down in there and rocked a while. And he said, I'm going to see you boys through this. I said, Mr. Pewitt, something else I need to tell you. We don't borrow money. I don't believe it's right to mortgage another man's property, do you? And this property will belong to Jesus. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I don't know how long we sit there. I didn't say anything. I already knew. Come on, Scott. This property is mine. It's coming to me some way or another. Yeah. This is the revival capital of the world. Right, I'm not worried about it. I don't care. We could be sitting there till yet. <laughs> God said what he said, and I'm doing what I'm doing. Thank you, Father. We sat there alone. He said, You boys come back to see me. <laughs> we made our appointment. Only this time, he said, I want you to meet me at a little restaurant there in Glen Rose. And he get, told, said this to, to my secretary. He said, and, and have somebody come uh, that can uh, write out and so forth, so on, a member of the board or, or something. He wants, to, he wants to be talking to an official of the board. And the man that was on our board at that time was in the real estate business. And a wonderful friend of mine, a man named Barry Hahn, he still lives in California. And so we went. He, and he's never smiled this whole time. That didn't bother me because the property is mine. Yes. It's been mine since before the foundation of the world. Yes. This is the revival capital of the world. Yes, sir. So we sat there and we, 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 he said, all right, now the whole contract is on a letter sized piece of paper. He said, now then, you got anything against rent? And I said, no, sir, I don't believe so. <laughs> he still didn't smile. I did, but he didn't. <laughs> he said, your rent, which was $23,000 a month, he said, I'm going to divide the property into four equal parts. Your rent will be $23,000 a month. When you can pay for a quarter, I'll deed it to you. The last, the fourth quarter, all your rent money will go towards the fourth quarter of the property. And he, he said, is that satisfactory with you? I said, yes, sir, it is. So he turned around and he said, can you write that down just like I said it? Barry said, yes, sir, I can do that. So he just, he just sat down over there and, and wrote it out. And uh, came over there and it, it, it was 1,500 acres at $3,500 an acre. Which came to five million and eighty-three thousand dollars, I believe it was. So, made the thing out. Sign, I signed it, then he signed it. And now he said to Barry, he said, "Now, write that over again, exactly the same way, and take a million dollars off of the price. I'm the first donor." Glory. He slapped the table and he smiled. And he said, you're going to be bigger than Oral Roberts one of these days. Amen. Just hear and keep your mouth shut. The devil will talk to you and all that. Just, just. So what? He's a zero. He's been brought to naught. Isn't that what zero is? But listen to God. Amen. Now, while they're writing this out, he said, uh, Kenna, he said, Portland Cement 
And now he's not talking slow anymore. He's, and he's also in the construction business. He said, Portland Cement has been after me to, to, to get some gravel off this property. He said, uh, go, go ahead and, uh, and, and I, I told them they'd have to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, you mean when I get a quarter paid for it? No, son. He said, I've given you all the mineral rights. Oh. Sell some gravel, boy, and pay for some property. <laughs> We hit natural gas out here. My Lord. We sold a million dollars worth of gravel and is tearing the place up. And I said, quit selling that gravel. I'm tired of that. Don't tear my place up, make it all ugly. Just quit that, praise God. I want you to know the Lord Almighty God paid for this place what seemed to me like overnight. Amen. Just paid for it. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Now think about what happened. We hit natural gas. We drilled the first three wells ourselves, which meant we owned that. Then we built a power plant out here running off of gas. Hey, hey, hey. So we made our own electricity. Hey. And we began to drill more water wells out here. So we got our own water. And all of the water uh, up in the, in the headquarters building and at our home all goes through reverse osmosis. So for a long time, No utility bills. No rent. And I'm in the middle of the night one night and I'm just laying there praying for my partners. And we're out of time almost, but I'll tell you this really in a hurry. And the Lord said, what had happened if all your partners quit? I said, I'm not going to go there. He said, don't remember. What would you do? I thought, well, they quit. I, I, they can't come get my car. They can't come get my airplane. They can't come get the property. I said, we don't have any utility bills. And I thought, my Lord, absolutely nothing. <laughs> he said, yeah. And, and he said, if, I don't care if they all quit, you'd have them all back in 90 days. Amen. That's the word of God. He said, cause you, I know you, you just go get in your airplane, go preach the word. Amen. And that's what I do. And we're out of time. Danke, dass Sie heute Victory Worte des Glaubens gesehen haben. Die deutsche Ausgabe des monatlich erscheinenden Magazins Believers Voice of Victory wird Ihren Glauben stärken und kann auch auf unserer Webseite gelesen oder heruntergeladen werden. Sie können auch den monatlichen Partnerbrief und die täglichen Andachten aus Glauben zum Glauben per E-Mail erhalten. Sie können im Sieg leben und das Leben von Menschen verändern. Vergessen Sie bis zum nächsten Mal nicht, Gott liebt Sie und Jesus ist Herr.